So welcome to the podcast. Sam, how are you? How are things going? Very well, very well. Been working away. How about you? Doing good. Enjoying my summer, doing a lot of cool stuff. But hey, this is one of the coolest things that I have done in the summer. So happy oh, to be awesome. here. I'm, I'm happy you're <laughs> here. So uh, what have you been doing of late? Well, uh, a little bit of the same. I mean, you know, I work for a company that is called American Geotechnical and Environmental Services, and we specialize mostly on transportation projects. So, you know, we have three offices, one in Pittsburgh, one in Philly, and, and one in DC that we are starting. Most of the stuff that we do is transportation geotechnics. So it's design and also, you know, construction consultation, uh, mostly foundation for bridges, slope stabilization, air retaining structures, things like that. So keeping busy with those kind of projects. Uh, but I have to say right now, I'm, I'm working on a pretty cool one in the city of Pittsburgh. We are stabilizing a landslide on Troy Hill. Uh, and it's right above Penn Brewery, and it's been extremely enjoyable because, uh, I mean, as you know, I love the city of Pittsburgh, and it's pretty cool when you can work on on local projects. And it is it is pretty special. I mean, I I came to Pittsburgh 20 years ago with the dream of you know learning geotechnical engineering, and especially landslide stabilization. And obviously, I have done a a lot of stuff in these 20 years. But you know that August 14 date, which is when I came to this country 20 years ago, is coming. And being at the top of Troy Hill, fixing a landslide and looking the city from that view, it's pretty special, you know, keeping the 20 years. So this summer has been a lot of a lot of that, which is which is pretty cool. And then just, you know, enjoying the the regular activities. Uh, obviously still taking a lot of precautions, you know, due to COVID and things like that. But no, all good. All good. All healthy. So can't complain. That's fantastic. Now, 20 years ago, did you mm -hmm. expect did you expect to be at the the level that you are now, looking back? Thank you. Well, I, it sounds like you'd have me on a very high level, right? Since you say it that way, but uh, no, I mean, not, not, never on my wildest dreams. I, I am extremely lucky. Uh, I have been blessed. You know, I mean, it's, I, uh, I was thinking about this the other day because I was going to that job site that I was telling you last week. Mm -hmm. um, and every time something that I always do when I go for construction consultation, I always love to buy donuts or bagels for the construction crew because we don't have a construction crew. We are just consultants. Right. Mm -hmm. So I always like to get to the side and, and, you know, kind of thank them because they are basically constructing what I designed. Right. So mm -hmm. it's cool to see it come in reality. Uh, and then I was going here in, in Oakland to, a, to a bagel place that is on Central Avenue and I realized that I never entered that place. When, when I came to this country 20 years ago, I always thought I used to live right next to it in 211 Morwood. And I always th thought I'm going to stop by and I'm going to you know, buy bagels, but I was always so busy. And then anyway, I ended up last week there while I was waiting online. I was like, I never realized that I never entered here and I always wanted to enter. And in the little five minutes that you have that we are online, it, it was like a lot of flashbacks, you know, and, and when I came to this country and then being here and and seeing how my career has you know evolved and all that and, and all the great stuff that i that i have done i mean it's you know it, it is pretty special i mean i love my career I, I truly i have done everything for geotechnical engineering i have lived my life in function of geotechnical engineering that's the reason i came here that's the reason that i'm still in this country you know it, it's a, it's a lot of stuff uh so it's 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 nice to see the evolution i mean last year i i received the Pittsburgh Civil Engineer of the Year Award by the Pittsburgh American Society of Civil Engineers. And I mean, I must admit that it was super special. You know what I'm saying? Because when you are so passionate for what you love and seeing those kind of recognitions and, and also, I guess, as the time passes and you start having your projects being constructed and become part of the city, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. The other one that I did is the CCAP. I don't know if you have seen it. It's right on downtown. It's basically a, it's a park that is about 579, I-579, the highway oh, between yes. between PPG between PPG Arena and the US Steel Building. So we it, at Ages we work on this with HDR. Uh, we did the foundation investigation, the foundation design for the cap. Uh, they did all the structural elements, and I mean it's it's a lot of it's a thirty million dollar project, you know, paid by the Sports Exhibit Authority and Pendor and different, but it's a big deal for the city and. You know, being involved in something like that, that is going to be part of the city and part of the history of this place, it's it's pretty special. So I know it's a long answer, but the answer is, yeah, it's super cool, man. And I love every second and of what I have done. And I, I truly hope that I'm blessed with another 20 years or more to continue doing stuff for the 
for the city that I learned to love. So it's great. You know, it's great to see that, that, uh, you know, engineers like you are out there and they have like such a, a great passion to make an impact. It's, it's always Thank good you. to see. It's always Thank good to you. hear. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate it. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So now that I have implemented the causation of sinking cities, I would like to move over to Sebastian where he can enlighten us on what is happening in the soil due to the extraction of water and the extraction of soil from overdraw mining and tuttling respectively. All right. All right. So let, let's start from, you know, let me just recap a little bit. Right. Um, so we, we can talk about different causes, you know, why, why a city or why something will collapse, you know, uh, so the, the first one, as you already mentioned, it will be more like the obvious one, right? Which is, and especially us here in Pittsburgh, we are very used to subsidence. So soil subsidence typically will come from, let's say, extraction of mining. Uh, there is plenty of, of areas around where, you know, we have deep mines. I don't know, it could be anything between 50 feet, 100 feet, 150, 300. So depending where you are, you can have subsidence. And, you know, that is very, that is very and widely studied because you have the Office of Surface Mining and they have all the maps and, you know, you can have all the all the things that you learn. So that, that's one cost, as you already covered it. Uh, another cost is that is typically could be karst, you know, and, and in Pennsylvania, we have a lot of karst you know, geology and topography, which is dissolution of limestone and dissolution of, of those kind of rocks. Um, that dissolution, sometimes people think that happened during our lifetime, but it's not. It was long time ago. It has these cavities that got filled with sediments and things like that. And then you have a groundwater table uh, as a result of changes on that groundwater table. So that's kind of where we start tying into the groundwater table and, and what you were mentioning. It. Uh, let's say that you change the pattern of the water going or you create a hydraulic gradient because you did excavation or something. Anyway, water will always travel between high energy and low energy, right? So once you create a difference in energy and then things move, it's going to wash those fines from those, you know, cavities and those joints and stuff. And that's what's going to develop a lot of, you know, cars. So in Pennsylvania, we have a lot of cars, for example, in State College. We have been working for years in the University Ar University Park Airport at Penn State in State College. The, there is plenty of areas on that. I mean, the whole airport, the whole runway was done on cars. And I have to say they have done a magnificent job there trying to prevent the opening some things. Uh, one of the coolest things that I have done is working working for two weeks at the University Park Airport runway at night uh, doing, you know, kind of injections of, of ground and concrete on the runway. So I have the chance to drive the runway back and forth, like, at, you know, getting at 11, a, at 11 p.m. and then driving my car at 5 a.m., getting out of there before a, a plane came. So that area, it, it's full of cars, you know, York, in, in also in Pennsylvania. And then as you start moving into that, you know, into different kind of states going down, you will have all that cars corridor, um, you know, plenty of areas, even getting all the way to Florida, also going a lot into, into Texas and things like that. So, but again, those are different because the voids were there, right? The voids, the voids were there a million years ago. They got filled with sediments, changes on groundwater table, not from where we are gonna talk as the main topic today, but just because changes in hydraulic gradients and, and different things, they opened that. So those two causes, let's say those are very famous and, and documented coal extraction and, and karst geology. Uh, those are more in the rock, in bedrock, right? So that's nothing to do with soil. It's just the bedrock having these, these things. Uh, there is very famous, you know, catastrophes based on that and, and, and things like that. Now, then we move into two separate areas that are more related to soil, which is, I guess, the, I, I just, I mean, I'm super, it has to be my OCD, man, trying to organize and categorize everything, right? So, but I want to start, that is bedrock. Now let's move into soil. Now mm -hmm. with soil, you have two phenomena. So you have many cities that have been constructed just on lakes uh, and, and, and cities like that include, for example, Mexico City, which is, you know, one of the, the worst. And, and that's going to create all kinds of other problems with liquefaction and seismic effects and things like that. Uh, but you also have parts of other cities like the place that I'm from, Bogota, Colombia. We also have parts of the cities that were, I mean, Bogota, it's uh, 300 meters, so let's say 900 feet, you know, clay deposit. Um, it used to be a lake in some areas of the city, and then they basically just fill it and construct it, like, you know, a fill in the lake. Um, so in, in some areas like that, if you, I mean, I know it sounds crazy as I say it out loud, but, you know, people did a lot of crazy stuff many, many years ago and they thought it was a good idea. So as you fill these places, right, uh, and then you load them because of just regular consolidation, things are going to move away. So let's just go back a little bit into what consolidation is, because I don't know if everyone is, is familiar. 
but my soil mechanics two minute class will be just <laughs> consolidation is basically a sponge you right you have a sponge full of water and then i just you know squeeze it out just push load on it and then the water comes out so when you put sediments on a lake or something like that you can create a potential mass that can consolidate right that one is we, we were going to talk about the natural you know which will be the next cause but at this point let's say that it's a man-made fit in a lake and some of that you put all this you put it low and then in years that's going to keep moving and moving and moving we call it in geotech consolidation settlement um, compared to the other settlement that we call it elastic which is immediate settlement and it's more like a spring you just have a spring and you press it that happens a lot on sands uh, but typically clays and silts and all that if they are in a loose state there or a, let's say a, a soft state that is going to be consolidation so many cities like Mexico City and, and as I say Bogota have a lot of consolidation issues which at that point it has nothing to do about pumping water out of the ground or anything like that at this point it's just you know soft sediments and load right so there is plenty of, of examples around the world for that now all, you know Mexico City also has another problem which is the pumping of water right mm -hmm. and and I think that's where you are more interested Bogota itself the part that I was talking, which is called El Lago, which is lake, basically, uh, it's, it's a whole neighborhood that is called the lake. It's not a lake anymore. It's full of buildings, all sinking, yep. right? That is the problem. Nobody's pumping water there, right? It's just that it was constructed like that, and it's now. Mexico has some part of the Mexico City is like that, but then the, the pumping of the water make it worse. And I think that's really where we are going today. So, so what happened is you have the ground, and let's say by now we talk about you can have sediments like sand that's not going to have major sediment issues uh, but really it's these sponges the clay the seals the one that have a water a high water content a lot of water compared to the solids that they have um, when you you know one of the oldest things that I, i'm sure humankind did is they make a hole you know they make some kind of well and realize that if you open a hole right at some point the water is going to fill it to a certain level that's what we mm -hmm. call the water table so the water table is due to infiltration to the surface water. You have rain, you have different things, uh, but there is always under us uh, some water that is traveling and is the groundwater. Uh, again, it goes from high energy to low energy points. So if you, let's say that you are at the top of a mountain and there is water there, the water is gonna infiltrate the ground and it's gonna travel thanks to a hydraulic gradient. It's gonna go from high energy to low energy. And and I'm sure you remember, that's all the fun that we have with Darcy's law at school and, 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 and all those things. Yeah. So. There is different, I mean, I don't want to get into super technical stuff. When I was at Pitt, I ended up taking groundwater geology and I also took another class, which is groundwater hydrology. So by no means I'm an expert on the topic. I just know enough to be dangerous, but there is a whole career that is hydrogeology, right? And, and I'm not a hydrogeologist, I'm just a geotech engineer. Uh, but you know, that goes into a different extent. But for today, let's just try to keep it super simple. So, you know, the, the principle is when you have soils, uh, you can define what is called an aquifer and you can define what is an aquitard. So an aquifer is basically, and my pronunciation may be wrong, but again, man, you have to be patient with me. I'm from Colombia. So <laughs> <laughs> an aquifer is basically a layer, let's say sand or something that allows the water to travel. Now, an aquitard is more like a clay uh, that it doesn't, it's kind of like impervious to water. It's not completely impervious because typically they could be full of water, but it's just the permeability or the hydraulic conductivity is low enough that it doesn't allow for a for a fast pace. Um, if you have, for example, an aquifer sandwiched by two aquitards, uh, that's what we call a confined aquifer. Uh, if you don't have the, you know, like the, let's say the clay at the top, uh, that's an, you know, like like an unconfined aquifer because it's basically whatever fluctuation is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Without getting too technical, what happens is you can have, if you have an aquifer between two sands of clay, you can have a hydraulic head that is actually above the physical top of the layer. So it's basically you have water under pressure. So keeping in mind that some some of the aquifers are like that, they are kind of under pressure. Some are actually just open and is the water. They were flowing uh, no matter how you do it i'm sure at some point somebody opened a hole in the ground they put a you know a pipe or something they see that it filled to some point that's what we call the you know the groundwater table so i'm sure also the next idea that somebody had at that point was like well if i open a hole and i see water let's just start pumping it out because i can use that water right yeah and 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 it's probably you know if if it's not passing if it's not passing next to something really contaminated or something it's probably one of the best waters that you can find because it passed through sands and it passed through different soils 
that kind of already did a, fil a filtration process for, for you, right. right? So, I mean, I'm talking, this is probably centuries ago when somebody realized this, and then you start pumping, right? You start pumping and get the water and, and you know, you have a water, that's what it's called a water well, and then you start using the water and all that. Um, as everything, you have to always keep in mind what is the recharge of that, right? I mean, that groundwater mm -hmm. table is a regional, it's a regional groundwater table. So the pressing, we call the pressing, but it's basically lower that water table. It's gonna take time, right? Because I'm only getting a few gallons. And again, I'm just imagining centuries ago. So I'm only taking gallons away. Uh, if the recharge is good, then it's gonna take a while. I mean, you are gonna generate what is called a cone, a cone of depression, which is right where you put the pipe, the water table mm -hmm. is gonna go down as a cone, but the far field is gonna maintain the level that it had before. Um, but as everything, as we start up using that, then if the recharge, the groundwater that is coming to that surrounding is not high enough, you're gonna start lowering everything. Not only the area that is right next to a pipe, um, but you know, or, or the well, but you are also lowering the radius around. And it's gonna, that cone that is depressing now, not only you have the cone, but you are also lowering the water table and doing that. And that's also when the problems, when the, when the problems arrive, because what happened to the soil? So let's say that you have, a mix of fines and, and sands and all that. When you take the water out, um, man, and I hope I'm not going to ruin the attention of everyone when I introduce the concept of effective stresses, right? <laughs> so our, our father of geotech, the guy that we owe everything, Carl Terzaghi, was the one that came with the concept of effective stress. Um, and effective stress, most people in, in engineering with a soil mechanic class obviously know what I'm talking about. But it's basically, when you look the stresses in soil, you know, like the loads that they have, um, you have the load that is just the weight that you have above, right? Just because I have soil above, if I imagine an element, a cube of, of soil, you know, let's say 20 feet below the ground surface, that is going to have the load that is above just because it's the overburden. But you also, in that overburden, you also have the water table. So because of buoyancy, and now we go with Archimedes and all that, because of buoyancy, the, the weight that I feel is not just, I mean, it's less than the weight of everything above because the water is kind of coming around and generating hydrostatic pressures. And these hydrostatic pressures kind of lift things, right? So mm -hmm. so then it's not that bad because it's like, I'm not carrying the entire weight. The water is actually helping me. And, and, and everyone knows what I'm talking about because you know, we go into a swimming pool or a bathtub and you know that your weight feels different. So mm -hmm. that, that's basically the buoyancy. Uh, what Terzaghi did is that he called it effective stress and he, and he found a way uh, which is, you know, the unit weight times the height, which is basically the stress, that's the total stress. And then you subtract the, the unit weight of water times the height of the water. And that is the, that is, you know, that, that's a very basic principle. Everyone with a, you know, with love for physics and passion and that know exactly what I'm talking. If you are in geotech, you know what it is. And mm -hmm. if you end up doing in some, something different than geotech, I'm sure you remember, it. somebody remembers all mechanics and it's like, yeah, those effective stresses with the little thing, right, above sigma. So, so what happened is when you, let's say that you have an element on the ground and you have a water table here. The moment that you lower the, ground, the, the water table, you are by definition, you are increasing the effective stress because that gamma H term that I was talking about, it's gonna decrease. So just by that, even though I have not loaded the area, just by that, I'm squeezing water, you know, I'm kind of squeezing water out of the thing. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, when I increase the stress, obviously it's gonna settle, right? It's gonna consolidate. What I was talking about before about, you know, consolidation settlement. So the more I pump, right? The more I pump, the more the groundwater table start going down, down, down. Um, and as the water goes out, effective stresses go up, go, soil goes down, mm -hmm. kind of squeeze out, and then consolidation start, starts happening. And, and then that is, a, that is a massive problem. Now, is that a problem everywhere? Well, it is, I mean, but how much you see it? So let me just give you an example. Uh, in California, because of all the, all the you know, different agricultural work that they have, and, and for years, they have been pumping the heck out of the groundwater table, right? right? Now, if you are in a rural area and you are just pumping out and you don't have a structure around or anything like that, uh, you probably are not gonna see it because it's all mm -hmm. relative, right? I mean, it's just right. gonna settle uniformly. So there is famous pictures, uh, for example, with, you know, like electricity poles or something like that, that right. they mark the years, right? And then anyone that took like a geology class or a soil mechanics class know what I'm talking about, because the more they pump, right? Then the soil goes down, but the posts stay there and then they just mark the years. Now, 
if I'm talking that in, in the San Fernando area and it's just in the middle of, of agricultural fields, it's fine. I mean, nobody, nobody cares. But the moment that I have a house or a structure next to it, uh, then it's going to start mattering. So, right. you know, for me, obviously being a geotech, like this is not my day-to-day -day work, but, but sometimes it is. Now, strange enough, my first job, my very first job in geotech, actually an unpaid job, you know, it was exactly on this. And, and at that time, I didn't really have all the knowledge in terms of the classes. You know, I mean, I, I, at that time, I, I was still kind of in undergrad. Uh, I was not at Pitt. I mean, this was back in Colombia. I didn't know. I think at that point, I probably just took soil mechanics, but I have not taken groundwater hydrology, groundwater, you know, all those specific courses, even the basic hydrology that we take as civil engineers. Uh, so let me just tell you a story because it's what's happening to a lot of places like Mexico, and it also happened in Bogota. Um, this particular project is not in Bogota, it's, it's outside Bogota, and it's at a scale that is, it, it's more manageable, but it, it really made me realize the magnitude of the problem. So as, as I mean, I'm sure as, as any civil engineer in the world, you always, when you're finishing your career, there always appear a friend of a friend that is like, hey, I have a problem with a property, and you know engineering, so why don't you come and take a look and don't charge me any money, right? <laughs> so, so this was like a friend of my mom or something like that. Uh, they have a beautiful house outside Bogota in the middle of a very nice area. It was just fields, right? Um, they bought it more like as a weekend, you know, like a weekend thing. And they really just have the house. It was nothing around. It was a two-story house. Um, and of course, they did not, you know, they didn't, it was not connected to any like aqueduct or anything like that. So they put a pipe, you know, they just basically created a well, you know, mm -hmm. they start pumping the, the, the water from the well just for using it on their house. So, I mean, keep in mind that it's a very low, it's a very low volume of water being taken. And that's probably why the problem, the, you know, it, it took so many years to develop. So they start doing it. Um, other farms or other houses in the area were also doing it. So they constructed the house and then they start pumping. And one day they realize they have a huge crack on the, on the corner of the house. So let me just take my calculator here because an engineer always have a calculator around. So imagine this is the property like on plan view. Let me just put it here. And you just get it. Let's say that they, they, this is like a cross section or whatever, or it should be actually more like this. Close to one corner of the house, which is where they were pumping, they start seeing that it develops cracks going like this. On the on the corner, so mm -hmm. you know they called me to take a look. Uh, I was I don't know, man. I was probably 20 years old, 21 years old, still still trying to finish my degree. Uh, I was already in geotech, love geotech. So I went there and they showed me. And, and obviously, you don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to realize it's like, all right, well that corner is the closest to the water well that you have, right? So it's like mm -hmm. it's related. The more yeah. you pump that well, the more yeah. the soil is gonna settle. So then I said, what is the foundation for the house? And they say, well, the foundation of this house is just basically a spread footing, a spread footing, you know, just around the, the house, spread footing with the walls and all that. So I was like, okay, well, again, without any numbers, you start pumping the water there, effective stress increases, it consolidates. And then obviously, literally, the support that you have below the spread footing is start going. Now it's not uniform because what we talk about when I when I pump out, out you know out of these wells I develop this cone you know this depression cone so as you know when I get it farther from the from the from the well I'm not gonna have that much settlement so part of the house and a spread footing on a slab foundation is not you know is is not seeing any movement while the one that is closed you know it's feeling all this. Uh, and, and the reason that I like to bring this is because this is a very small scale example, but this is what happened at a city level. And, and I'll, I'll connect it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a few seconds. Okay. So what happened is, you know, they did this and then they asked me, what do you think is the solution? And I was like, well, I mean, understanding that is because of the pumping, you increase the, you increase the effective stresses. Basically your spread footing now is, is no good, right? You have to go to that corner and do some piles. So the guy was like, okay, well, let's, let's see. So I, I just remember taking a literally a napkin and I started just drawing with like a Sharpie or something. And I said, well, I will do like some kind of, you know, some kind of footing. And he said, well, what dimensions? And I like, I don't know, man, probably a few meters this way, a few meters this way, try to put like six piles. How, how deep were the pile? I was like 20 feet, 30 feet. Like, I mean, 
the first thing as a geotech engineer that you know is you never do anything without a boring. Because if you don't do a boring, a test boring, you don't yeah. know what is there, right? I mean, it's right. like, if you don't get samples and all that, we make a whole career out of that. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I don't know, I, I don't have any boring, but I give him some dimensions. Next thing that I know is he called me two days and he was like, can you come here? Um, I think we have a problem. We start doing your footings or, or your piles and we have a problem. And I was like, how the hell do you start doing my piles? It's like, first of all, these are not my piles, you know, right? I, I just give you like preliminary stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do you find somebody that can construct them so quick? So, so what happened is this was a pro, you know, this was a problem that was kind of common in that area for different residential things. Uh, there was a guy in the region, you know, I mean, this is like a, around a small town. Well, the guy got an ogre and he was doing piles for everyone. The guy has no clue about anything of geotech, but he just <laughs> knew that he was doing these holes, putting some kind of rebar, putting some kind of concrete and connected it to the footings. So what, what this particular person was having as an issue, everyone in the region with a, with a, you know, with a well, we're experiencing. That's the reason that he was able to find this contractor to do piles, you know, hand over and all that. It mm -hmm. blew my mind because I never knew somebody could do piles that easy, you know, and with a, with a hand dagger and stuff like that. But the, the reason they say problems, when they excavated, when they opened around the footing, they found a gap that was about a foot between the soil and the spread footing. So, and, and that to me was mind blowing. So what happened is the soil right next to, to that corner already moved down a whole foot just because of consolidation settlement, just because of having a higher vertical effective stress. Now that did not happen on the other side of the house. And since mm -hmm. it was like a spread footing, basically that, that half of the house or the end of the, of the house was literally cantilever. It was, a, it, it was imaginary like a cantilever mm -hmm. on, on one foot of air. So the solution in that case, um, you know, was very simple because then we just put the piles. I mean, again, my first job as, an, as a geotech engineer, zero calculations, man, just going with guts. So I was like, yeah, let's put these piles. And they basically put the piles, they backfill it with grout or, or with concrete, and then they connect it to the, to the spread footing. Uh, it was a very successful solution, you know, and then the guy that was doing the pile, I think he started copying it, the solution to do it in every other house in the, <laughs> in the region, but, but it illustrates as a small scale, the problem. So now let's, let's blow this from here and let's go to like Mexico City yes. now. So, so what is happening is exactly that. You have all these foundations, right? And, you know, they have all these piles, you know, obviously if you know that you are in an area that is prone to have settlement like that, you don't go with just spread footing. You try to go with piles, some kind of deep foundation element that is getting the resistance from below. Um, but that brings all kinds of issues because for example, in Mexico, it's so thick that you are not going to be able to take your pile to bedrock. You probably are going to still be in some kind of more competent soil. Mm -hmm. So it, that is what we call still a friction pile because it's not completely, if the pile goes to rock, it's an embering pile and it cannot move anymore. But if it's still kind of floating on that mass, it's just getting resistance as friction, you know, right. but it, which is pretty good compared to a spread footing, but you are still, you know, it's still not something that goes to, to something rigid. So you have in Mexico, the fact that you also start building on lakes and things like that. So that's one settlement, but you also have the fact that you start pumping water out. The more you pump, the more the, it, it increases. And then you start having all this. Uh, the movement that only happens, obviously it creates for spread footings and, and things like that for like low construction, small houses. But even on, on, on big buildings, now you start having settlement. And even if you are on piles, you are still kind of bringing the piles down and everything is, everything is kind of coming down. So it, it is, a, yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. As I said, it's not only the fact that you're pumping out, it's also the fact that you construct on, on ancient lakes and, and, and things like that. Uh, it's interesting, even the, the place that I, that I grew up, it's a, in Bogota, it's a huge city, man. It's like 8 million people. And so it's, it's very different than living right now in Oakland here in, in Pittsburgh, but it's, it's a city with a lot of buildings and a lot of density and, and stuff like that. Um, so the building that I, that I live on, um, I was actually lucky enough that my dad was involved in some part of the construction. So I have the chance to go and see it during construction. It's a five-story building. Uh, it was all done on piles. I remember being there when they drove the piles and it was good. It was a solid foundation. Now my mom still lives there. And every time that I go, it amazed me because the building in itself has been sinking right but but it has been sinking to a very small rate uh, nobody's pumping water out of there because this is like the middle of the city so it's just due to the load and and these piles uh, but every time that i go you can see like what was the entrance of the building has moved down and and you can see it with the sidewalk right yeah. so it's like the building kind of has a difference on on things so 
some areas are, are tolerant. You know, I mean, some areas, um, and I, I'm, I'm just saying tolerant in, in the sense that if you look at building, it's it's about 30 years old. And if it moves one inch on 30 years, uh, every structure can can take it. Now, right. the big problem is also if it's differential settlement, and, and we call differential settlement when it's not uniform, it is an issue. Mm -hmm. The house that I was telling you as the example, my first engineering job, um, it is an issue because part is not moving. One side of the house is not moving. The other one is moving. So now I have what, what, what is called angular distortion because it's basically like an angle coming, coming down. Uh, in that case, it's an issue. But if the entire building moves down uniformly, then there is no issue. You can have issues with some utilities and things like that, but typically those can be easily fixed. It's not like the whole right. building is it's coming down. So yeah, so I mean, there is plenty of examples around the world of, of cities that have these kind of things. Um, and, and it's not ideal. You also have it on, for example, the airport in, in Osaka. They basically just created the airport and more land you know, on the runway. So the right. whole runway was kind of created in the ocean and just put in fill and, and things like that. Uh, that thing has been moving forever, you know, because it's not because of pumping, but it's just, you know, sediments and, and trying to, to compact. The, the, the Palm Island in Dubai, I think it's called, when they fill the ocean with the stuff, also massive, massive movements. I mean, constructing on, constructing on things that, are, that were not initially, I mean, it's doable. And I think mm -hmm. as we move with engineering, there is more and more techniques, but even if you know, even if you put a lot of technology and injections and all that, it, there is so many variables and that can wrong that that you can result on, on moving. So there, there you have it. That's yeah. the whole explanation, man. And and without a beat or anything, just like woo, solo like that. So didn't even need a whiteboard. <laughs> I know, I know, and it's hard <laughs> because I move my hands a lot, man. And I it's, know it's, it's, it's hard to not have you know something to explain. But let's hope mm -hmm. that that's clear. I'm the same way. I, I, I'm used to, <laughs> I'm used to turning around writing things. Yeah. It's, it's a totally different, it's a, it's a culture shock, but exactly. yeah, you're totally right. And I didn't even uh, explain that really is like the, the, not only the impact on our buildings our bridges, you know, the, our transportation systems, our homes, but also our utilities, um, mm -hmm. just not okay. At, you know, solving one issue with a water line to your house, you know, through a parallel isn't bad, but solving, mm -hmm thousands of parallels is, is, is a big issue. And um, yeah, these cities, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it could be a block. It could be half a city. It could be a whole city. You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it, it can, it can compound on itself pretty fast. It's a big snowball effect, I think. Yes. But, um, yes. I mean, I, I think by now, obviously like humankind understood and, and especially government and regulators understand that you cannot pump the water um, you cannot pump the water where you live. I mean, there is, and, and again, I mean, I, I, I kind of apologize because I'm just giving you a, a one side of the story, right? But you have to forgive me because I'm just a geotech engineer, right? <laughs> there is a whole environmental thing that I have not even brushed on that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that that is beyond my area of, of expertise. But, you know, from the point of view of geotech alone, uh, mine kind of already kind of realized that you cannot, you should not be pumping water for consumption right where you live be, be, beyond any kind of contamination, but just, it's never mm -hmm. a good idea because settlement is going to happen. Um, you know, so obviously the main cities have pushed that away, you know, but it's, it's the outer areas where it's still, where it's still happening. Now, the other part, the other part that, that, is, that is sometimes hard to, to really understand is the time rate of these movements. Uh, so what, what happened too is consolidation takes time. You know, right. like if I go, let me just put an example. If I go today, um, well, actually, I have plenty of examples on my on my job. We have plenty of jobs that we are doing, let's say, a new roadway, a new embankment, and we are doing it on top of, a, let's say, of a clay soil or something that is going to uh, settle. Just because we put a 30-feet embankment, let's say that if I put a 30-feet embankment on top of 10 feet of, of clay, depending on the, the hydraulic conductivity, but really what we call, you know, the coefficient of consolidation and, and the time rate coefficient of consolidation, C sub B, the, the settlement that I'm going to get it's not gonna happen in a day. You know what I'm saying? I mean, even mm -hmm. I put all the load today, it may take three years, 10 years to develop. So right. the same thing happened. Like for example, I, I have a project right now on close to Allentown in Pennsylvania that we did the forensic investigation for a few embankments, but these are these are like 90 feet embankments. They have couple bridges on top and they have been settling for 30 years. So we were okay. trying to understand uh, if it was cars related, if it was consolidation related and, and things like that. So. The same way that happened by just loading it, you know, by putting an embankment, you can have the same effect just by suddenly moving the groundwater table down. 
it's going right. to take years before you actually start seeing the, the settlement. So these are not immediate things. So by the time that you realize, you may not be pumping anymore, but mm -hmm. the damage was was done. It's already so, done. Yes, exactly. So it, it's, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's extremely interesting. I, I think the positive is that we have moved away from from that as a general trend. You know, I mean, I, I don't think there are many cities that are still doing it like, you know, on a regular basis that they are just pumping from where they live. Definitely in rural areas. Uh, I mean, oh, yeah. most mm -hmm. people don't really understand what we're talking. So when they realize it's like this friend of a friend or whatever, that is just boom, you have cracks on your on your house and it's like, okay, I learned the lesson the hard way, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Well, thanks, Sebastian. That was, that was very insightful. Another major city that fits the bill for this episode is Mexico City, and we mentioned it a little bit before. So in most parts of Mexico City, the land is sinking at a nasty rate of nine inches per year and could continue to increase in the next coming decades. So since the Spaniards took over the Aztec civilization there, they drained the lake the Aztecs were built upon and built a city that now houses more than 22 million people. But now that the depression where Lake Texcoco once filled is now occupied by cities and it poses two major problems. Uh, the first problem is major floods and a second and saddening problem is clean drinking water. So Mexico City primarily pumps water from groundwater deposits that accounts for up to about 50% of their water supply, which is pretty astronomical. 50% of the water supply for 22 million people is, is a ludicrous number, which directly correlates to the average sinking rate of Mexico, that Mexico City experiences. So NASA's global positioning systems and leveling data have shown that the sinking has increased from eight centimeters to, in the early 1900s to nine inches a year in the present day. And this rate is projected to exponentiate over the next 150 years. And that's what you were talking about is, you know, consolidation over a over time does tend to exponentiate. It's not going to happen within the first day. It's going to take months, years, yeah. you know, decades. Um, but so the continued sinking is affecting the infrastructure of the city. You know, Mexico City is projected to sink up to 65 feet in the next 150 years. And if the rate of groundwater extraction isn't severely lessened, that's, you know, what what do you think is going to happen in Mexico City, Sebastian? Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's very unfortunate. And, and the numbers that you obviously are, are throwing are insane, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they are wrong. It's just that it's, it's insane to try to understand those magnitudes. And, and and it's also kind of insane what, what I was saying before, you know, that, I mean, most governments and, and, and most places have learned that it's never a good thing to keep doing it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still very hard to regulate, right? So it, especially, I mean, you're not pumping water in downtown, right? You're doing it on the on the outskirts of the city and different areas but even though we know that is bad and it's nothing new it is still happening so mm -hmm. yeah so that that is kind of sad to realize but the other part then is how wh how you fix it right because that's that's what we are here for and i mean the civil engineers that's our purpose always so what do you do i mean it's not easy to put the water back you know into the soil mm -hmm. and we don't really do anti consolidation trying to inject water and pumping it into the into the clay that it doesn't work that way. Um, right. There is, I mean, there is different things that have been done in different areas of the world, trying to, you know, trying to kind of alleviate things. Uh, you can try to, you could do some kind of injections of different materials like grout or, or, or different more fluid mixes uh, that you can put under foundations. Uh, and again, it, 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 for me, it all goes back to that first example that I was telling you, because that's yeah. what we did. We put a house and then we ended up putting concrete under. So you mm -hmm. can try to do that for specific foundations, but that's money, right? That's a lot of money. Uh, and that's similar to what you see people sometimes fixing their basements or or their driveways or something that they just try to inject grout under and, and, and try to fill the support and all that. But that's not going to work on a big scale. That works on a smaller scale. Yeah. Um, retrofits, as we call them for bigger structures, uh, work. I mean, they, they, they have a proven record. You know, I mean, basically you can hog, you can... You can go to different structures and, and try to do this. I was in I was in Sao Paulo, Brazil about two years ago. They invited me for a keynote lecture there that I gave. Um, and I always say that the best part of that Congress was not the part that I gave, but it was so much that I learned just from seeing these, you know, like the, the Brazilian engineers, all the 
all the imagination they have for things. And mm-hmm. but anyway, they were showing a, a building in 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 one place that I don't remember exactly what city it was. But they have a problem like this. I don't know if it was exactly because of pumping water or just consolidation. But it was basically trying to retrofit a massive building, just doing a lot of a lot of micro piles and and drill shafts and all kind of things. Uh, obviously, it cost a fortune. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it has yeah. to be. It has to be a heck of a building and, and extremely important that you want to invest um, these kind of, you know, these kind of foundations. Uh, I mean, we definitely can do it as geotech engineers because for us is is basically trying to go deeper and and, and find something better. Um, but it's not simple. So are you gonna do it for every single building on this series? And then when you start saying 65 feet, it's like nothing is gonna resist 65 feet. No. Now to to also tell you what happens sometimes with these problems. So I go back to my first example, the one that I did when I was not an engineer. So I designed these piles or designed on a napkin and just from God's without any number, right? The person ended up constructing that and stabilize one corner of the house. Then something like 10 years later, mm-hmm. I I think I run into the person that we have in common. I don't exactly, but then basically, I basically just think and say, what ended up happening with that property? So what ended up happening with that property is that they stabilized that corner and it was fine. It never moved again. But then the rest of the house start moving down because of what we say that the cone takes time to develop. Right. So then they have to apply. So he was basically like the corner that was in problem, we fix it so well based on your recommendations that now it's not moving, but the rest of the house now is moving and it cracks again. <laughs> so it's like oh, it, it no. was too good of a solution. So they end up going and implementing on all the on all the four corners of the house and it it cost them a lot, but I guess my point again, extrapolating from the st- small example to the big city thing, is you also have these phenomena. I mean, it's gonna vary, and and and, and it's it's a it's a nightmare. You know what I'm saying? It's not gonna be easy, and it's not gonna be cheap, and it's not gonna be sustainable. I guess that will be the word that I would say. So, right. so I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I'm sure a lot of buildings are not gonna, you know, have good luck, and then probably they are gonna end up having. Now there are having many issues. We see that in Bogota. Um, obviously, there is massive problems in some of the buildings on this part of the lago, the lake that I was that I was telling you about, construction mm-hmm. on top of that lake. Um, and again, it may not be because of lowering the groundwater table, but just because of consolidation settlement. Some buildings uh, probably have done retrofits, but the majority have not. And 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 when you go on the street, you see all these doors like this, and and you know, obviously. People with means will not tolerate the risk, but people with no means are going to tolerate the risk because they have no other option. Right. So, you know, we are talking Mexico City, it, it, you know, the, being Mexico in the sense of uh, a very wide range. You have one of the richest men in the world living there, but you also have very poor areas. So right. you tell me who is the one that is going to do the retrofits and who is the one that is going to just let the building go to to Raul. So, yeah, so, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, it's, it's going to be complicated, but, you know, unfortunately... Right. The water That's, involved and also the the just the aspect of the sinking cities is is a, is a humanitarian crisis it's not yes you know, correct it's, um it it's something that's going to take uh, a little bit of everyone uh, mm-hmm. to, to fix and you know just going to some of these these conferences like you were you were just talking about um got to put the best minds in the world together to get this stuff done yeah yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. so what what other places stand out to you that you've you know been talking that have you like you've come across in the civil engineering community? There is probably plenty of places. I mean, that oh, yeah. that comes to my mind right now. Well, I mean, obviously Mexico City is the is the, is the biggest one. Uh, yeah. Bogota has many issues as we talk. Uh, California has, you know, all the areas, but now you're going into more the agricultural side, so it's not that much of a problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have the Osaka runway, uh, and there is like different areas, but I don't know if it's, uh, you know, more like isolated and, and because different reasons. Now, you also hear the term, you know, like, you know, sinking cities, but but it's all relative in the sense of there is not only because of the groundwater. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, obviously we have established that pumping the groundwater, you know, on a city, it's a bad idea. Stay away right. from that, right? right. <laughs> but you, we cannot blame it for everything. So there is also right. a regular settlement of loading for constructing on lakes, but you also have different effects. So for example, the, you know, you also have the flooding and, and Venice yeah. is one that comes to my mind because uh, mm-hmm. There is a little bit of consolidation settlement, a little bit, but but it's also just the sea level, you know, moving up. So right. there is plenty of cities that are seeing that uh, because of global warming, either you believe it or not, it's happening. So, you know, you you will see that a lot of the cities will have those problems. Nothing with groundwater table, nothing nothing with that. Uh, there is also the effects of liquefaction 
that we haven't really touched base on that, which really has nothing to do to clays because liquefaction really happens just to sand. And, and it's just the phenomenon that you have a loose sand. You have a loose sand um, that is, imagine that you have marbles and you have like one stock on top of each other and the sides, it's kind of like a loose pack structure. Uh, it's full of water. It doesn't have any clay. It doesn't have any cohesion or adhesion or anything like that. It's basically a frictional material. Uh, mm -hmm. And now you have some kind of shear wave that comes. It could be from an earthquake. It could be from any other source, uh, tectonics or whatever. And you know that basically does this. Basically, just kind of move the particles. It put it. It pack it. Same example with the marbles. If you have what is called a cubical structure, and then you 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 move it and you go to more like a six contact, like an hexagonal structure, then you will see that you densify the sand. And when you densify the sand, the water that was there is going to be now under excess pore water pressure. And in many areas, that excess pore water pressure is going to need to be relieved somehow. And that's when you end up having like the sand boils. Um, you know, in, in, right. in New Zealand, for example, when they have in Chris Church, when they have all those earthquakes a few years ago, or more like a decade ago, um, that isn't what are happening. I mean, you have all these things coming out, and obviously, if the sand comes out, then it's just you know it's going to be all kind of all kind of sediment. Actually, University of Texas in Austin was doing a, a massive research project there, trying to to prevent liquefaction, you know, and or not prevent liquefaction because the seismic part you cannot have it. But it's like, what do you mm -hmm. do? Um, I'm a huge fan of ground improvement. Uh, you know, there is plenty of companies. We're lucky in Pittsburgh that we have great companies like. Menard and, and you know, but there you also have Kaler and many other people in the area that you can do what is called like ram aggregate piers or stone columns. Uh, they provide drainage paths that all the success for water pressure can dissipate. Uh, and basically there is many techniques that as geotech engineers we have developed to provide ground improvement and, you know, decrease the chances of liquefaction. So liquefaction is another area. Um, we are locked in Pittsburgh. We don't have any, any of that. Um, there are areas, for example, like in Colombia, that we do have a lot of seismic, but in certain areas of the country, we don't have the saturated loose soil deposit. So liquefaction is not an issue. Other areas it is. Um, you know, there is, there is plenty of, of areas in the world that changes that, you know, that have the sand deposits and, and can have liquefaction. So I would say flooding and liquefaction are other two causes beyond the, the just lowering the groundwater table, beyond just the load. And then the obvious one that we said with coal extraction and, you know, and karst. Um, New Orleans, mm -hmm. I think you, you know, at some point you were mentioning it before that that New Orleans also have like issues. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of coastal cities mm -hmm. are going to have issues. And, and and some of these can have like two or three together. I mean, um, I'm just thinking, man, poor Mexico. Everyone in Mexico probably is hating our podcast because we're criticizing. To them, but it's, just, <laughs> it's true. It's... They seem to have a lot of pro problems. I mean, when yep. you go to the, you know, like when you go to like Playa del Carmen, that area or area in Cancun, you can go to what they call the cenotes which is in this limestone, they have all these karst filters and, and things like that. So obviously, if you are have a city, I mean, Cancun is not yet to a point that is like massive skyscraper and stuff like that. But if you start constructing on all this and you can have the potential for collapsing due to karst, but then you are next to an ocean that may be changing, you know, I'm not saying that the one in, in Cancun is changing the level, but I'm just putting as a hypothetical scenario. You can have mm -hmm. two or three of these combined. You can have cars combined to the, the water going up and the areas of soil, you can have different things. So yeah, right. I mean, I guess it's a very complex problem with a lot of variables. And, and I think in the past, humankind has not really been very careful on that. And we are paying the price now, right? Right. I mean, we only, we've only been engineering stuff like this for, you know, maybe a couple of centuries. So it's, uh, it's always a work in progress and everything's an, always a dynamic issue. Uh, it's just yes, how well we can correct. simplify it to get, to get to a, an appropriate solution. But, Correct. Oh yeah. Um, hmm. Sorry, just went through. I, I just got into. I got into a, a funk there for a second. All and right. The, um, you know, we were talking about li liquefaction. Uh, one that really jumped out to me. Whenever, whenever Japan had their last series of earthquakes, mm -hmm. um, they developed. It, it was funny because, like, if you look up the, if you looked at the, the images there, they have buildings that were beautifully structured. Mm -hmm. It's solely sound. They, they endured the seismic activity and, but the soil underneath them gave way. So it's just like a perfectly, like a perfectly well-built structure that is just like sunk into the soil. Yes. No. <laughs> and, and, and that happened a lot. I mean, even on the, what was that? The Kobe earthquake in 95, you, you have images of some buildings, you know, like collapsing and stuff, but then a building a few blocks away, not collapsing. And, and that's what happened with, 
soil dynamics and, and seismic engineering. That is, if you depend on the soil, the soil deposit characteristic can change in a few blocks, right? So you may have some structure that resist, some that don't, and, and, and some structures from the point of view of a structural engineer, some structures could be better than others, uh, but they, the good ones may collapse because of the soil conditions, uh, mm -hmm. you know, while the other ones. So it always goes into, there, there are many cities, Bogota is one of those cases, uh, for some reason, San Francisco is probably the prime example of that. For some reason, the good places of the city are on the worst soils, and the poor parts of the city are on the best soils because they tend to be kind of towards the mountain where the bedrock start being exposed. Mm -hmm. So sometimes different conditions, you know, because of that, you can have, you know, certain big structures where the money is in the worst soils possible, you know, while the lower structures, the lower building, the lower houses are in, in areas that are that are very, I mean, it's such a complex thing on, on, on how humankind develop around places and, you know, we create cities. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, we mentioned a lot of different, um, a lot of different case studies in terms of failures. And so how do we solve mm -hmm. these, these scary, uh, these scary issues that pop up all over the world from everyday, even just everyday human consumption, um, industry, governmental impl implementation and, uh, agriculture, but, um, you'll find out after this, break. we pray, we pray yeah. a lot, I guess yeah. <laughs> we yeah. pray a lot that people do do smart stuff yeah i mean it's, it's not easy uh, you know when we go back to let's say the coal the cars there is a lot of stuff that you can do in terms of backfilling you know like mm -hmm. you can inject you can grout uh, we do it all the time around this area that we go through mines and we do grouting plants which is basically once you identify the, where the seam is that was the coal was extracted you can go and develop like let's say every five feet or five feet by five feet or ten feet by ten feet whatever the spacing is, you can just go and do like these injections of grout. And then you mm -hmm. basically just fill the voids. Uh, with cars, we do something similar. Cars is a little more complex because it's not like a, when you have a mine, it's a very delineated volume that it was extracted. Mm -hmm. When it's cars, you have all these paths that is hard, but you can still try to put injections and still try to backfill things. Um, so those are probably on the spectrum. Those are probably the easy. Consolidation, it's, it's, it's hard. Like what we say about lowering the ground or the table is probably mm -hmm. retrofits. Uh, things like that. But then you get into the part that is more philosophical. I mean, what do you do with the, you know, with some levels of, of let's say, the seas coming up and putting some cities down? I mean, that's not something we're going to fix as geotech engineers, um, you know, or, or things of that nature. With liquefaction, definitely, there is a lot of things, go, you know, that have been developed in the past 20, 30 years. As I said, ground improvement being one of the best ways. You know, there is all kind of ground improvement techniques that you can do to avoid liquefaction. Uh, and things like that. So we are getting there, but it's, we are definitely not there completely. And, and I don't know if we're going to be, you know, because uh, as engineers, we can only fix so much, but probably one of the biggest solutions is the cost, right? I mean, if we can fix the cost, uh, just go back like to the segment that we were talking about, you know, Mexico and officials and still 50% of the drinking water coming from pumping. So it's like, right. I mean, that's never going to be fixed, right? No, it's and, and and again, I'm 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 staying away from environmental aspects because I don't really have the knowledge on those. But I'm sure somebody can give us another two hours of talks just because of the environmental aspect of this, right? I mean, it's yeah, it's oh, definitely. Complex. There's, I think you know, uh, co um, you know, collaborative work uh, together will get this get this done. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, just with any any field, anything that you you really have um, major problems in, there, there's mm -hmm. a learning curve into it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're on this, we're on this beautiful, um, enlightenment or arc, I guess you could say of, 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 uh, of knowledge in terms of being able to solve these complex problems. I mean, correct. you know, correct. what we do today might not, might not be even be the most effective thing in, you know, 20, 30, hundred years, you know? Yeah, um, correct. And I mean, and, and that's part of, it's, it's extremely important to identify what you say, the multidisciplinary approach, right? I mean, um, mm -hmm. you know, I love what I do and I'm a geotech engineer, but at the end of the day, I'm just a geotech engineer. So for more than, you know, I may have a great image of myself in my mind, I cannot solve everything. You know what I'm saying? Like in, in these cases, like, you know, everything that we have been talking today is kind of just like common knowledge of things that I have done, but really the part that I specialize, it's, it's more on the foundations and stuff like that. So when you think mm -hmm. about solving a problem, you need the guy that does the foundation, but you need the hydrogeology guy. You need the geologist on this. Right. You also need the, you know, like the, the public person, the government official, the, I mean, it, it, you need to get everyone on the table to really start, start solving this. Now, something that we have not really talked also is a lot of the cities and a lot of the places that we have mentioned, 
uh, they are also developing country. You know what I'm saying? And, and I mean, I, right. I know, and I apologize if anyone takes my terminology of developing country in the wrong way. But what I'm saying is, there is all kind of other things associated with these countries, right? In terms of corruption, in terms of other needs and things like that, that make mm -hmm. it even more challenging. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, it, it's 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 extremely complex solutions that you know they are not. I mean, something beautiful in the states is that we have a really good. Uh, government here and a really good system that there is a lot of things, uh, a lot of, a lot of people in power with with many, many good ideas and good thinking and things tend to get done and and and, and get they get you know they are thought through the process you know and, and people in power have the capability to take decisions. Um, unfortunately, there are many countries in South America and Central America that don't have the same. And again, I, I don't want to criticize anyone in particular, but we know that. I mean, I am a citizen from also from one of these countries. I mean, I, I grew up in Colombia and I know the challenges that we also have. Yeah, you know, well said. You know, I'm, I'm glad you were able to share some valuable tips and information there on even the like the, the cultural aspect, the world, the worldview aspect, uh, prevention and remediation tactics. And now these people, you know, yeah, they, they really need to realize that there is hope for building a, a resilient infrastructure and to also maintain their homesteads and also their livelihoods. And uh, I'm glad that that we as engineers can provide that for them in the future. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just just to kind of close with with a with an example that I would just come into my mind. It's not exactly because of of lowering the water table, but I was involved on the on the state of Delaware. I actually. I was one of the co-authors for the bridge design manual of the state of Delaware. Again, just taking taking care of the of the geotechnical aspects of that, and and we work with AECOM and great geotech engineers like Paul Moffitt and and actually a structural engineer like Neil Shimo. That we work on that manual for about two years, and when we were in the middle of the manual, um, they have an emergency at Del Dot with the it's the I-95 over the Christina River, and and, and it's a very interesting problem to discuss here because there is no you know it, it, it's something that we kind of are still learning which is lateral squeeze which is a little different phenomenon but it shows you the effects that this thinking thing can have so it's basically you have a bridge uh the piers are on they were on piles initially right uh everything was working it was working fine for many years um a contractor came you know to basically they needed to put some some weight for other project they were, in, they were within the right of way where they could place this. So they were not doing anything that it was illegal. They end up putting a lot of material, constructing an embankment right next to one of these piers. And they have one phenomenon that is not that common on geotechnical engineering, but it's still documented that it's called lateral squeeze, which is you put a lot of force in, 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 in a clay, but mm -hmm. it, you don't even allow it to settle vertically, but it just kind of goes down. You know, it just goes to the side and creates like that. So by, by the ground doing something like that, it end up compromising those piles, you know, and right. the, the pier end up kind of bending. So it, it's, I mean, you, you know what they say that everything that is tragedy plus time become comedy. So this is perfectly the example of this because we were doing the manual and that was when my, when my son was born and I have to skip one meeting for the manual because of that. And then I tried to connect with the group like the next day and nobody was around. And I, and I just remember thinking, well, even better because I need to take like a week off to stay with my new, you know, born son. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't really try to make contact. And then after like a week, they appear and they say, hey, sorry that we were not in contact. And, you know, they have this emergency. So state of Delaware, Delta is magnificent. It's, it's one of the best clients that I can that I can have. They acted and AECOM was extremely involved in that. They did a remediation because this is similar to the sinking cities. It's a different cost, but it's the same mm -hmm. problem of, you know, land shifting and moving and, and doing extreme behavior. Right. Um, and they end up, I mean, Paul Moffitt from, this was published on, on Geostrat and it appeared everywhere in ASC. He ended up designing these awesome, magnificent drill shafts that end up going to rock and, and stabilizing the whole thing. Uh, it was constructed in a record of like two months. It, it, I mean, it's they got wow. all kind of awards for all this, but... I guess my point on the story is that there is plenty of solutions when you have massive settlement and massive things like that. As geotech engineers, we have the solutions, but they are, they cost they cost money, right? And and are you doing it for every building? I guess that's the part. I mean, if mm -hmm. that happened, I'm moving to Mexico City, man, and I'm fixing every 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 single building. But it's just I don't right. think everyone is gonna have the the budget to to pay for all that. So as geotech engineers, we have a lot of good solutions, but it's like you know it's sustainable in the sense for a city, right? And I think even um, as as we move forward and, and things keep continuing to sink in these sinking cities, I think 
even just having um, a plan B option of, you know, uh, strong, uh, low income housing in terms of just ha just getting ready to flip uh, for these mm -hmm. people, just to yeah. make sure that we still meet their, you know, hum humanitarian needs is, Correct. is, is very Correct. important. And Correct. also, since we understand the behavior, um, that we can then use our tactics to implement a, a sustained, um, you know, society of, of, of these low in income housing. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's true. That is yeah. true, man. Yeah. So thank you. I really appreciate you being on. It was, it was a lot of fun. No, no. Thank you very much. I mean, thanks for the invitation. Obviously always talking to you. It's, it's fun. And I mean, I, I, I did check the, you know, I have saw the podcast and I think what you guys are doing, it's, it's awesome in terms of the, of the content that you are generating and, and the new angle that you are trying to put. Uh, I mean, we know that it's a market that is getting saturated with a lot of, you know, yeah. Podcasts and stuff, but but I think it's it's important that you you guys definitely bring something new on the table and kind of like a new angle and the audience that you are trying to 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 get. So obviously, I'm super excited of being part of this and you know very thankful for the invitation. Awesome, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh. That is all for this episode of Woke Talk Podcast. Now I'd like to give a big shout out to my guest star Sebastian for sharing his wealth of geotechnical knowledge and his vast professional experience with all of you. We hope you take away important information in regards to what is happening in these sinking cities, why it is happening, and what we can do to fix and mitigate the effects of groundwater overconsumption. Woke Talk Podcast would also love to encourage you to invoke change in our society and voice your concerns. We need leaders to protect our infrastructure, our environment, and resources necessary for the survival of future generations. Just remember, change does start with you. So thank you all for listening to Woke Talk Podcast. I am your host, Sam Stanford. And as always, stay woke. Woke Talk Podcast would like to give a shout out to Anchor by Spotify for sponsoring our podcast along with Ben Sound Music for providing our show with intro, outro, and advertisement background rhythm.